Okay, I, I think it's uh, time to start, folks. It's 10 to the hour. Yeah. Let's go. And uh, let's queue up the uh, Toronto crowd for a 10 minute presentation. I'm just going to share my screen here. So Peter, I put you as a co-host. So now you have the authority to mute people if you want. <laughs> Can you see it full screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'll start by that. muting myself. Um, so today uh, we went to High Park in Toronto and to, to discuss uh, deletion of the canopy. So that was the theme of the day, but specifically we looked at um, deletion of black oak savanna ecosystems and grasslands, um, which was done through historical fire suppression in the area, uh, primarily because it was an urban center. Um, we also looked at uh, deletion of invasive species and shade tolerant succession species like um, sugar maples and whatnot uh, through prescribed burning as well to kind of help bring back the old ecosystems that were there. And then we also looked at the deletion of the high park canopy by pests and diseases causing defoliation and dieback. And then as a bonus, we also got a nice presentation about maintaining old heritage trees or veteran ancient trees, things like that. Uh, so this picture you see here is uh, there are a bunch of sugar maples and this was actually uh, it, it's really bare ground little to no grass and the area was actually designated as a picnic area back in the 50s. Um, and it was like mowed and, and maintained that way for recreational purposes. And this kind of went against the wishes of John Howard who actually donated the entire parcel of land to the city stipulating that it remained a natural area and they went to just kind of turn it into a recreational park. Um, and because of control like this, invasives began infiltrating, which is uh, like Norway maple started getting in the park, which is bad news. Um, however, in the 70s, um, they started decreasing the amount that they manicured the parks and they started kind of letting it naturally maintain itself. And then um, in 1989, after studies, they found it was a black oak savanna like centuries ago, and it was given um, the provincial designation of natural and scientific interest, ESA. So environmental, environmentally significant or sensitive area, and they began trying to convert back to a black oak savanna. So this is uh, this picture you see here is closer to like it is kind of what they were trying to accomplish with the grasslands and the you know sparse oak trees there. So it was this was the original ecosystem there, and it was maintained by indigenous nations before um, North American settlement. Uh, so this. Uh, the whole point of these ecosystems, they kind of retain about 30% canopy cover and then the rest is, is grassland. And so they just, the oak trees will thrive in this environment and it supports a lot of biodiversity in there. The ecosystems are also naturally drought and heat resistant and they're very climate adapted, which is great news in the wake of climate change. So as, as it gets warmer, these ecosystems will still do well. Um, so, and this, these ecosystems are also off, able to offer areas of full sun, part sun, shade, and so it just kind of supports the whole lot of different uh, plants and animal species and insects that live there. And grasslands especially are highly effective carbon sinks, which is why these ecosystems are very important to maintain because they actually store a lot of carbon in the roots and the soil um, underneath as opposed to above. So if there's fires, it, uh, a lot of the carbon still stays in the soil. And so this is just, uh, so prescribed burns are something that actually happens in, in High Park now. Uh, this, the first trial tested this in 1997, 1998, and then they officially started doing burns in 2000 and occurred yearly, except for the past two years, just because of COVID. Um, and so these pictures here, it's a little blurry because we, the original pictures up here, if you can see my cursor and then that's the zoomed in one. But uh, the one on the left is, is uh, that's post burn and then like immediately after post burning. And then the one on the right is one week after post burning. So you can see like grass is already regrown in very, very quick. So these, these ecosystems jump back up right away. Um, yeah, and the, the burning is actually like, it's a very, um, uh, what's the word? It's a very like it's interesting for a lot of people to see. Like the media comes out, the community comes out. Like everyone wants to see these prescribed burnings happening. So it's a really big event every year, which is why COVID kind of shut it down because it's just like too many people are out here trying to get access to the park and coming to see it. And it's there's just too many people to do it right now. 
Uh, and then kind of shifting a little bit, we after prescribed burning, we did get a little bit of a presentation about pests and diseases in Hyde Park. So I'll just run through some of these ones here that they're kind of dealing with. So the top two, so emerald ash borer and then the LDD moth are obviously like the two biggest ones there. But they're also dealing with things like canker worm, uh, woodborne beetle, um, amarilla root rot, Dutch elm disease, and the Asian longhorn beetle was actually eradicated, but we do have simulated um, examples of what it would look like if, if they were in the trees and they use that as a way to kind of show um, residents this these are the signs so keep an eye out for them and they encourage residents to call if they do come up. Um, and then things that are on their radar are the are HWA and oak wilt like especially oak wilt, oak wilt um, because of all the oak trees that they're trying to maintain there. And these things are like just right at the border in Detroit, I believe they mentioned. So they're very close and they're, they're keeping a close eye on it to make sure, you know, they're ready if it comes up. Um, and just some, a little for more examples here. So like, this is just a sign that they have posted there of the um, Asian longhorn beetle. And they have like a tree where they drilled holes in it and they kind of scratched off some of the, the bark to show like what longhorn beetle would do or Asian longhorn beetle would do to the trees to kind of simulate the effects. Um, and then on the left here and the right, these are two pictures of LDD moth eggs. So you have the lighter patches are the older um, egg bundles. And then the darker one slightly at the top is kind of sitting on top of an older one. That's what it would look like if it was newer. Um, and then the picture on the right is a little hard to tell, but that entire branch you see in the, in the center of the picture is completely covered with like eggs and, um, you know, uh, caterpillar uh, or sorry like like their the skin that they shed and whatnot so a whole bunch of, of material there from the the LDD moth um, and then the other thing that they did actually mention just was, was kind of interesting so there are a variety of methods for control for LDD um, so they do things like vacuuming the eggs which I, was actually kind of interesting to me because I've never heard of them just walking up vacuuming the trees um, but they also use uh, like trees in for which they use for EAB. They inject it into the trees, but it works for um, for uh, the moth as well. And then they also use things like sticky traps. And they tried aerial spraying um, back in 2019, but there was a lot of pushback from the community about they did felt they weren't properly consulted and people were worried about the dangers of it and affecting other moth species. So it, it hasn't been repeated since. But that was something they tried and it was successful where it was tried. Uh, and then last thing we talked about uh, very briefly was we maintaining heritage trees and, and veteran and ancient trees in the cities. So th these pictures here, the one on the left is not from our, our walk today. We didn't, we didn't really get a good picture of a, a veteran tree. So I just pulled one off the internet, but these two on the right you see are actually just standing dead, dead trees um, in the park that were left there for habitat for insects and birds. Um, so basically from the presentation, it was primarily focused on allowing trees to age and die gracefully. So heritage trees can also be, can be declared due to a variety of reasons like size, um, age, ecosystem benefit, the importance to communities uh, or groups, as well as cultural significance. And specifically, we talked about um, cultural significance to Indigenous communities and how that's a rising reason um, for declaring heritage trees and also a very important one. Uh, so maintaining these heritage trees or veteran trees um, are very beneficial to bio biodiversity because of habitat, food, mating sites, etc. And you can't really leave all of these trees standing, as you can tell from the pictures, because they're they're going to be a little bit. Some will be a little bit dangerous and a risk of diversity might not even want to try. The goal is to leave some. And if we can leave them around the city here and there, they they provide like great habitat pockets, like all over the city, for a variety of species. And just end the, the presentation with a very quick quote that I, I thought was, was very nice. So the presenter, he heard it in England and he, the quote was, an oak tree grows for 300 years, rests for 300 years, and then expires gracefully. And it's meant to just be a, a, a point about how oak trees, for example, like the, they'll, they'll last a very long time and they'll, they'll be there for a long time. And even after they're gone, they'll be very important and support a variety of species. So yeah, that is all we had today, I believe. Uh, if anyone wants to jump in and throw anything out, uh, we're only at eight minutes and 50 seconds, but if not, we can uh, we can cut it here. <laughs> That's fantastic, way to go. Hey, thanks a lot, Josh. We can still take time for a question, I assume, Peter? Oh yes, uh, absolutely. Um, maybe you want to unshare the screen and then we can see each other. 
Sorry, I'm just trying to, how do I stop share? There it is. <laughs> so I find the, um, the prescribed burning in uh, downtown Toronto to be a totally fascinating concept. I've been uh, associated with forest firefighting for almost 50 years, having done a lot of uh, firefighting in Northwestern Ontario uh, in the mid seventies. And I, I, through my career in Northern Ontario, I remember uh, prescribed burning for silvicultural purposes gone wrong. We had a bunch of deaths in prescribed burns north of Thunder Bay. We've had a lot of mature timber and, uh, burnt that wasn't expected to be burnt. And every time there's something that goes wrong, the Ministry of Natural Resources says, moratorium on prescribed burns across the entire province for five years, then we'll revisit. Have there been any issues uh, with the control of the controlled burns in High Park? Uh, so uh, I'm gonna answer, but Josh, feel free to jump in there if I say something that sounds wrong. Uh, it doesn't sound like it, but I, I think as soon as we started what what I think what what's obvious from uh, from chatting with people responsible for these burns is that they are super super localized. Like these are not big areas getting burned, and so it's it's very organized. They they sort of they bring in these prescribed burn uh, consultants who are specifically uh, organized or specialized in this thing and who will sort of decide which smaller patches in the park will, will, will be burned in, a, in a, any given year. And then they, they, they build uh, fire, uh, fire barriers uh, all along the, the, the undergrowth. And that seems to be mainly like, it's, it looks from the pictures that we saw, it looks like all that's required is basically raking the undergrowth material over like a, one meter about and, and that seems to be enough to stop to stop the fire and I assume and then they bring in a lot of volunteers as well I think Josh maybe you can say something about this but I think a lot of students from the forestry faculty actually chip in uh to monitor the burns as they're as they're occurring so there's there's a lot of uh it's, it's a big event with a lot of people keeping a close eye I think mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I to also say, like, you know, I was, I was born in Toronto, I spent most of my adult life here in Toronto now. And like, it's just one of those things that it's natural, like, we're, we're like, oh, like, you know, it's that time of year again, like high parks on fire. But it's, it's, it's just one of those things that there's no real, real pushback from the community. It's, it's just, we know it, we, we like that it happens. And, you know, it's, it's very safe. We haven't had any issues with it as far as I'm concerned since it started. So it's, it's very, very controlled. Is this an example where uh, Toronto is forfeiting quantity of canopy for quality of canopy? Because it seems to me that, um, oh my goodness, are we going to get rain again? Oh, crap. Um, we, can, so, we, can, we can give you two minutes to reset. Yeah, <laughs> with, the, with the oak, uh, it seems you'll have a uh, oak savanna, you'll have a sparser canopy but it'll be the quality of canopy you want, even if it's a lesser canopy than whatever else would be growing there, including the Norway maples. So, so I don't think that canopy cover is really the end goal here. Uh, it didn't, it didn't, I mean, it contributes, but I think the main, the main target here is biodiversity uh, in terms of ecosystems and in terms of species. Uh, I think that was the and cultural sort of cu cultural significance as well. I don't know, Josh. Oh yeah, absolutely, and I, I do agree. Like I, I don't think canopy cover is our main concern. I, I but if we're going to kind of focus it around that, um, I, I do agree that I think they're aiming for a, a higher quality like canopy and ecosystem because they're trying to restore a, a historic or historical ecosystem that was there. Mm -hmm even though it means, you know, only having 30% cover in those areas, it's, it's higher quality and better for biodiversity. Anybody else have a question for the Toronto folks? No. Shall we go to Montreal then? Yes. Who has the honors in Montreal today? Oh, Ramey. 
The floor is yours. It's Romain and Jeremy. <clears throat> Can you see the, okay, good. Um, yes, so today uh, we were at the identity, I think you can just switch the, the slide, please. I think you scooped ahead a bit. <laughs> and you can just uh, close your mic. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so uh, yes, we, we went visited the, visiting the Aiden city. So um, this is a plantation that was made. Uh, it's like a demonstration plantation uh, that was made to show to the citizens uh, how functional diversity works. Um, so first, uh, sorry, we talk about the diversity and bene benefits of diversity. And we talk about the different aspects of diversity like functional diversity, taxonomic diversity and genetic diversity. Uh, we talk about why is it good to have a high functional diversity, for example. Um, and yeah, so this identity, uh, it's like a demonstration pl plantation. We have like uh, 48 trees planted uh, representing 27 species that are adapted to urban environment. Um, but this is just for the citizens because the IDEN city, so IDEN, just to remind you, it's International Diversity Experiment Network with trees. Uh, we can see some uh, in North America, there are others in Europe. There is one in China, I think, and another in uh, Africa. Um, and this type of plantation are uh, experimental device to, uh, to test some question about the biodiver biodiversity um, ecosystem function uh, relationships. Um, and it's it, the aim of the IDENT is to answer to question like uh, how to choose spe species and traits to create resilient forest or urban forests. And um, there are other questions um, that, that are dealing with complementarity facilitation. Um, how do we achieve, um, how, do we, how do we can um, plan to have uh, over yielding in plantation with mixture of species uh, compared to the monoculture, for example? Um, so yes, that's pretty much it. But, so we see the arboretum, which is the plantation. Then we had like the double spiral of the species. And at each species, we have like a visual um, that presents the tree that they planted. Um, so we have the characteristics and uh, we have the benefits of this species, for example. Um, next slide, please. So with the ident, we, we they, they try to, to see how biodiversity can affect the ecosystem services, but trees also produce some these services. Um, um, the, 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 the services that, that we know the most uh, are the allergens that comes from um, VOC, uh, that's uh, for, for uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, such as pollens, for example. So VOC are, uh, are good for plants like to communicate, for example, but they create some allergies for people. So that's, uh, that's becoming a, a huge issue uh, in cities like in Montreal, for example. Um, firstly, because um, there are a lot of uh, male trees. So some people are, are speaking about uh, botanical sexism because uh, cities were planting only or well, mostly male trees because uh, female trees produce um, fruits and they just don't want that because of uh, security issues and uh, hygiene issues too. Um, but the fact that with the global changes, we have early springs and higher temperature is it's just uh, exacerbate this problem of pollens. So Rita de Sousa, which is a, a postdoc of uh, the PAC lab, of Alain Paquette uh, lab, uh, presented uh, us what she was focusing on. Um, so on the, on the picture, we can see uh, a trap that uh, traps the, the pollens. Um, I think that before her experiment, there was only one trap in Montreal 
to do the predictions on pollen abundance and uh, the pollen peak in the city. So now I think there are um, 20 traps and she wants to see if there are some um, differences in abundance and, um, and uh, yes, uh, that's pretty much it. Okay, you were me? Uh, so after that, uh, Kesa and Megi told us about their, their project and their goal is to determine which species of trees are the most uh, resilient in a context of drought. So for that, they uh, sampled trees in five cities, Montreal, Quebec, Hamilton, Halifax, and London, to obtain an environmental gradient. And um, the trees were located in two types of land, uh, land use, so street trees and park trees. And they also select, uh, selected five of the most common tree species in the cities, which are Acai platan platanoides, Acai saccharinum, Plexinus pensylvanica, Quercus macropora, and Ulmus primilia. And for the experimental design, uh, it's basically l'anthrochronology. So they took uh, three cores. You can see uh, an example on the picture here. And, and, it, and they did that to measure uh, the growth in, di in diameter, because it's the first uh, growth characteristic that trees abandon when they are stressed. And finally, uh, Matt talked to us about the risk assessment in, re in uh, urban trees. Uh, so trees are cemented to two major stressors, which are gravity and winds. And trees medi mediate the effect of trees by making a uh, compensation wood. Uh, compression, compression woods, I'm sorry. And I think uh, we can see it right over there on the picture. So there are three levels of risk ass assessment uh, by cars, walk by, and uh, turn, around, turn around the trees. And the first, uh, the first type by cars is the most of the news. And it's quite difficult to... Um, sorry. Uh, predict a uh, tree failure and there are three factors to consider so the first one is the potential for failure which are a uh, structural structural defect the environment of the tree and um, if the tree could damage uh, property or uh, people of course uh, the tree or the branch of course and that's basically it <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. So I think uh, people followed Peter's instructions very well today. They're paid off. Yeah. They are afraid of you, Peter. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, because of what Maggie told us. Uh -huh. <laughs> so do we have any uh, questions for the Montreal folks? No one. Peter, you probably have a question. Well, thanks for putting me on the spot. We, we talked a bit about risk assessment uh, here and we um, this morning. We also talked about uh, tree valuation when it comes to the removal of canopy in the context of development. And I wonder if it's a common practice in Montreal to calculate up a value for a tree to be removed and then to figure out whether you get cash compensation or tree, tree number compensation from the developers. Any Montrealers uh, able to answer that? Uh, maybe Matt, you want to jump in? <laughs> sure. Um, interesting, Peter, it is not here to anywhere near the same extent. In fact, I'm not sure um, how much you went into tree valuation. There are, are a couple of different methods. Uh, and in fact, here in Quebec, uh, we use an older version of the tree valuation and our values are much lower because of it. Um, I think it does happen, um, but there's not to my knowledge, there's not the same uh, that's going on in Halifax. And in fact, I think Halifax has 
done quite well uh, using some of those valuations uh, to get some remuneration, uh, perhaps compared to even other cities. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's unfortunate. Um, but I, it, could certainly be expanded on. There's a new version of the valuation manuals coming out, and these are these are kind of a North American wide um, valuation method. Uh, and I think once that gets worked out, it's been about eight years in the, in the making. Uh, once that gets worked out, um, and the kinks get worked out of that one, we may see kind of a, a more um, median valuations put on trees, and then it may become more common practice in a construction development project to see that happen. But right now the values can be so wild uh, depending on assessors that I think sometimes developers and cities are grappling with using it as a, as a baseline. So, yeah. Thanks, Matt. And Not sure that answers it, but. Maybe I can also add that in the city of Laval, they are working on a fond de l'arbre. I don't know how to traduce that in English, but uh, when there will be development uh, and, uh, and some trees are cut, they will have to compensate and give some money to the city to help uh, plantation or plantation program. Um, so it's a, a way to compensate uh, the loss of trees. Will they do it before the development or? Yeah, before right. the development, but there's a lot of legal question to ask before so, put all the this this thing together. So the developer has to give money to the city before? They, they will have to, it's not uh, okay. actual yet. That's, uh, just to clarify what it is, that's, it. that's called a, a, a tree bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the city doesn't keep the money actually, they give it to a bank because it, it's, it's a bond. And when, once they finish the development a few years later, then they give them money based on whatever they have kept. Okay. I, I had a, a comment and maybe maybe Matt could clarify, clarify what I said, but one thing I've learned from you, Matt, this morning, and maybe it's wrong, so I have to check, but I think I understood that if there was more intervention on trees when they are younger to prevent some future uh, breakage, we may actually have less problem and be able to keep many more trees so that there is a need maybe uh, be more proactive in, um, in, in maybe doing some intervention early on. And to the other extent also, maybe there is often, uh, we cut trees way too quickly because we see a defect but the defect is actually not having any impact on the stability of the trees. But of course, when you have a, a defect, it scares people. So I, I think um, there is lots of effort that can be made, both in terms of prevention and in terms of education so that we can keep many more trees. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, um... Uh, you know, the industry as a whole has tried really hard to um, put an emphasis on structural pruning early on and fixing a lot of problems. And we right now uh, in all cities are dealing with old problems. I mean, that's really what we're ha what we're dealing with. It, you know, uh, big cuts made 30 or 40 years ago are the reason why trees are coming down now in many cases. And if we can manage them early on so we don't have to make those big cuts uh, down the in, in down the road, uh, then we can retain the trees a little bit better. I mean, there's also a, an issue of nursery practices, and I mean, we could open a, a huge can of worms on pruning and how we manage trees early on because so many of the problems that we deal with down the road, multi stems at eight feet of height, because that's where we tend to try and clear for, um, and then we end up with multiple stems at that height. Like all these sort of issues. Uh, if they get dealt with earlier, would mean that trees could potentially be retained longer down the road, uh, for sure. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, I think a, a, a lot of, unfortunately, litigation comes into it and you see we, we have named a defect. Uh, we have an issue in the tree that uh, is a presumed loss in strength. And so if we don't act, uh, then we're duty of care uh, means that we're at fault if something happens. Uh, and so we tend to act often prematurely because we're afraid of being sued. Um, I guess that's a societal issue, perhaps. <laughs> oh, 
let, let me lend a bit of a Halifax perspective to these very same questions because we did discuss them both today. Uh, two sides to this. <clears throat> One is uh, we have ramped up our street tree planting program by about double uh, compared to last year. The council said, uh, get going with more. And this was a bit of a shock to the urban forester, but he's got to put in 3000 street trees this year. But what he fears is not being able to get to those street trees within the first two or three years to do a structural pruning. And that's more to train the tree to grow well. And especially if there are power lines above to train the tree to for the maximum chance of avoidance of those power lines. So it's uh, Halifax really wants to get into a systematic program of visiting every new street tree within two or three years. Um, and of course, this takes a little bit of training because there are a lot of people who think they know how to prune a tree uh, for long term structural integrity, but don't. And then the second issue we talked about in relation to the cyclical pruning of it of the mature tree canopy is that the city is trying to adopt the principle of keeping a tree alive as long as possible. And so even if it's looking somewhat sickly uh, when they're doing the pruning program, if it's not um, a risk with respect to uh, falling, uh, then they'll try to keep it even if it means they have to come back in three to five years and ultimately take the tree down. But extending the canopy uh, life is something they want to do. We're not going anywhere. No, I know. I'm just it's just raining here again, so we have a problem. <laughs> and do we want to move on to the next uh, group of presenters? Yes, excellent idea who I think are UBC, Vancouver, and Germany, if I recall Peter's order. Yes. There's not, well, sorry. There's not gonna be any information from Germany today. We cut it short, so you're gonna have Caitlin to fully focus on. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, no updates from Germany today. Germany is resting. <laughs> so let's see. Um, I'm still expecting a picture from Germany from you though, for the website, Joanna. Yeah, I'd be happy to provide one for sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Thanks. The floor is yours, Caitlin. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, representing Vancouver again today, um, talking about canopy cover loss. Um, and I will be talking a bit just quickly about canopy loss in the region, um, reasons for canopy loss in Vancouver canopy cover loss on private properties in particular, and um, just quickly touching upon the tree protection and removal bylaws in Vancouver. Um, on the left here, um, I actually stumbled across this uh, last week. Um, and this was in Cole Harbor in Vancouver, tree removal with this little um, construction uh, cone on top. And usually I'm like really sad to see tree removals, of course, but I, I knew I had wanted to take a few photos for this presentation. So it was like the one time I've ever been like, I was like, oh, a tree removal. Good. I can, I can put it in this presentation. So, um, so here's a removal here. Um, but yeah, um, so regional canopy loss between 2000 and 2014, this is again pulling from that urban forestry strategy guide from 2018. Um, so this is from a study that was done by the University of Maryland, and they're looking at just kind of this region of BC, um, kind of the, the broader Vancouver region areas of canopy loss, um, then canopy cover seen in the green, red is loss, and then gray is just kind of like less dense, of course, um, more impermeable, like we were talking about yesterday. Um, and so the in the report, they cite that the biggest reasons for loss are from urban development and construction, um, particularly on private properties. But they do mention um, storms, a bit of wildfires, and some wood harvesting as well. But urban development and construction is, is definitely the, the major reason. And then so for the in the city of Vancouver, the reasons for tree removals. Um, so they do talk a bit about the future and kind of proactively planning for the future. So they do mention pest disease and climate change. Um, but I was surprised to, to see that again, like pests and disease, it's more um, thinking about the future. 
and I kind of investigated a little bit and I, you know, I found that um, emerald ash borer and like Dutch elm disease actually haven't entered BC quite yet. So, you know, as we were talking about in cities further east, um, that's definitely an issue both in Canada and the United States. Um, but again, they haven't they haven't quite got to BC yet. Um, and I know we're we've seen gypsy moth and I think Asian longhorn beetle um, just cited, but again, um, these issues haven't yet surfaced. So, you know, as Sandy mentioned, this is kind of like um, hopefully a chance for Vancouver and, and BC to kind of um, learn from the other cities and hopefully plan accordingly, but we'll see what happens because um, it's a very complex issue as we described. Um, but yeah, so the, the biggest uh, problem with canopy loss though is urban development, like I said. In the city, some of it comes from public property um, infrastructure upgrades. Um, so the, the strategy guide, or the strategy mentioned um, infrastructure upgrades, like in Stanley Park, for example, they had to kind of widen the, the highway a bit, so we lost some trees there, but really most of it comes from private property. Um, the strategy, uh, urban forestry strategy mentions that almost 3,000 trees are removed annually on private properties um, between the years 1996 and 2018. Um, and I forget, I have something on the next slide, so I'll move to that because I forget if that's just removals um, just on private property or if it's linked to urban development. Um, because here, so then the strategy is talking a bit about on private land. So on public land, we've seen canopy cover actually increase um, in Vancouver, but on private property, can, canopy cover has been declining. Um, they talk about how 40% of the city's urban forest is made up of trees on private property. Um, between 96 and 2013 alone, 50,000 trees were removed through city permits. And they actually used to have this like bylaw exemption um, that accounted for 50% of these trees lost. So it actually allowed homeowners to remove one tree a year, I think just like any tree and it could be like any size. But from my understanding, they amended that in 2014 so so homeowners couldn't do that anymore um which is good so um but the the strategy still says that canopy cover is um still happening due to construction it's also happening due to poor health of trees um and i remember reading in the strategy as well kind of talking about what peter and matt were just um describing about early structural pruning um the strategy meant mentions how they're really trying to focus on like this early pruning of trees um, just to kind of like, to, to kind of like try to reduce premature removals and make sure they're structurally sound because they, they cite that um, this leads to a lot of like premature removals essentially. So, so yeah, and also they want to, um, they encourage as many replacements as possible when trees have to be removed. Um, and here's a, an example of a building that was being replaced. Um, I didn't have a DBHT tape on me, so I didn't measure this tree, but um, I'm assuming it's smaller than 30 centimeters, um, which is why I'm assuming it doesn't have like some sort of tree protection around it, um, but it is right next to this, this building. It looks like they're trying to retain it, so that's good. Um, but again, it doesn't need any sort of protection. Um, and then a part of the plan, so they said they want to increase enforcement of the protection of trees bylaw. Um, so I will go into that. Oh yeah, I put a question mark. You'll see, not the next slide, but the slide after that, because it kind of gets a little dicey. Okay, so um, this is just, uh, this is the Vancouver's protection of trees bylaw. Um, they require a permit for any removal of any trees that are 30 centimeters or greater. So unless the tree is smaller than 30 centimeters or it's, um, or yeah, so sorry guys. I have like a lot of notes here. I'm trying to be succinct, but um, so yeah, if the tree is bigger than 30 centimeters, it cannot be removed unless it's diseased, dying, hazardous or dead. Um, but again, it kind of gets me a bit worried about the trees, you know, that are just being established and are, you know, maybe 20 centimeters to 30 centimeters because, you know, the trees are already there. They might be doing well. Um, but, you know, what happens to these trees if they're allowed to be removed? 
And I also kind of wonder about like the effectiveness um, of these kinds of protections and laws because you know it sounds like trees can still be removed. You just need a permit and you need to pay some sort of fine um, or fee to get it removed. So I'd be, really be interested in learning more about um, you know how many trees are getting removed, what kinds of trees, what reasons, um, and and kind of the efficacy of, of all this. And then that being said. My last thing I was going to touch upon, I was kind of like following up with some of this, and this is an update, um, a news article um, from June, and it looks like the city is actually suspending that permit, um, and they're allowing people to remove trees that are 20 centimeters, um, up to 20 to 30 centimeters now, and the reason why they said this is because there's a backlog on all these permits, and the city is trying to save like time, mm -hmm. essentially. They said that uh, releasing this backlog, it would allow them to save like two to eight weeks of processing. So again, you know, the city knows that urban development is, is a problem for these trees. Um, and it had wanted to kind of like even strengthen these protections, but now it looks like, you know, due to lack of resources and staff and time, they're actually kind of um, removing some of these protections. So we'll see how this affects the canopy cover moving forward. And that's what I have for Vancouver. Um, so yeah, happy to, to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Caitlin. Does anyone have a question for Caitlin? Sure. Uh, I was wondering, so this, this is going to be a quick one. Uh, in, when you were reading the report, do you know if the city requires any kind of information about the tree that is being removed when they do like the species or, or the diameter or something like that? I didn't see anything. Um, and I actually had wanted to, to look a bit more into it as well. Um, I kind of started like t um, pretending I was going to apply for a tree permit, um, but they wanted me to create like a, an account and I hadn't gotten that far yet. But um, yeah, like the city that I originally, I worked in a few years ago. So I, I um, got my master's in Chicago and that's where I did my thesis. And I actually, my thesis was on tree preservation during residential construction. Um, so, which is why I was a bit interested in this. And in the city that I worked in, like you said, they do pay attention to species. Um, so certain species, especially like the oaks um, and hickories and ones that were like significant to that area, they had more protections and were almost like never removed, no matter what. Um, whereas there was like, there's basically three different classes um, and they had different levels of protection depending on, like I said, size and species. Um, from what I saw in Vancouver, it doesn't look like they have anything like that, at least not um, readily that I can see, but um, I'm, I'm definitely also interested to, to see more of of how, how their permit process works. Um, and like you said, if they consider species or anything, because, you know, as we discussed, um, you know, there's more, there might be more value depending on the species, um, you know, especially if it's native or long lived or, or something like that um, versus if it's more like invasive or something, but. I mean, I think it would be a great idea to require homeowners to disclose that kind of information to just to keep an eye on the private urban forest and, and what, what's being done there. Yeah, yeah, to definitely. I, yeah, I think I saw that they need to hire an arborist or something to do an assessment. Um, and so maybe the arborist will will disclose like, yeah, the species and probably the condition. Um, especially if they're trying to say like, oh, this tree is like dying, you know, and it's not or something. but. Thanks. I'll let somebody else take the floor. Yeah, uh, Sandy, did you have a? I don't, I don't have a question really, but I mean, I guess it's from Toronto's end is the private tree bylaw. So it's similar to what you're describing there for private on, on property, private property that it's over 30 centimeters, then you have to apply for the permit. It costs, I don't know, $200 or 250 and people get, it's quite interesting. The public gets very, I rate about being required to pay, not just to remove it, but also for the permit to disclose some of this information you're describing yeah. um, and that the city can stop, in fact, often does prevent them from removing it. 
they have to pay to apply for the permit and then the city can say no if the mm -hmm. conditions aren't met. Um, and that seems to be, of course, I, I'm not sure I've had private citizens call me over the years and complaining and outraged by the city. And I'm not sure that does any uh, benefit for urban forestry because it, it creates this feeling, there's this sense of self entitlement and to yeah. some extent of your own property that how can the city stop you from doing this? Yeah. And I often, what I try to explain to them is that the city requires you to apply for a permit because I think that how they explained it to me initially with the private tree bylaw, it was education. Like it was trying to get the homeowner to understand why it's good to keep a tree, that there'd be a conversation started up. But what happens with the homeowners is they just see it as an impediment. And this isn't talking about big developers. They have rules and they do have to do replacements. It's quite clear, but it's the private landowner. I don't know if we're creating more enemies <laughs> or, yeah, or yeah I think it was uh, Amory said yesterday, he like, he referred to himself as the tree police sometimes. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then just to bring up to the city I'd worked in, um, yeah, at times there'd be people who would cut down trees without getting a permit um, because, you know, we're talking about properties that were like multi-million dollar, just like the land itself. And so, you know, some some either like out of town developers or people um, would just like cut down the trees essentially and kind of like, you know, better to to slap a fine, pay a fine. I think it was like $1,000 per tree, um, especially right. if you couldn't get the tree removed um, and a permit wouldn't allow it. Well, you know, $1,000 a tree isn't a lot um, when you're talking about such an expensive property. So there's definitely loopholes. And like you said, sometimes it ends up rubbing the, you know, homeowners the wrong way, um, especially if they're the ones who are doing the work and, um, and can't afford this kind of stuff. But. Yeah, and these private tree bylaws, I mean, what I've heard this explained somewhere along the way is, you know, those municipalities that have them wish they didn't, and those the ones that don't have them wish they did. And so th it's not easy. Um, it makes sense to have them because it raises the profile and the value of protecting those trees and it forces a conversation whether the citizen wants it or not, but um, it, it's a lot of work. And, you know, it makes the city or the municipality the, the bad guys um, in most cases. That's how they're seen. Very true. Uh, so. I'll just... It just okay, interject for a quick second. Um, here in Montreal, our, our private tree bylaws uh, in most boroughs and definitely in the town of Montreal starts at 10 centimeters. So we are way below that. Yeah. And I think most of the time it works fairly well, um, you know, at least from, from my experience. Uh, but 10 centimeters is nice because that is uh, something under that is, you know, volunteer thing that popped up in the backyard and really you should get rid of. And anything over exactly. that started to establish. And so it makes the homeowners uh, plan, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I thought 30 was pretty like large, um, all things considered, like you said, you know, the tree's kind of already established. So um, I think it 10 can... sounds great. Yeah, I think the city I worked in last, it was about 20 centimeters. Um, I think the 30, and, and it does vary around the Toronto area, the GTA. But I think it was there because back to a point of our, our um, session this week is canopy cover. Like it, it was perceived that 30 centimeters had a significant canopy cover. So you don't want to lose them. There, there wasn't much thought that when they're little, they'll have more canopy cover. It was just sort of, yeah, look, these are big enough that we can see them on the map. They actually have some canopy. <laughs> so you guys mind if I wait? in on this issue of private bylaws. Um, they're very subjective, thing, I think. I mean, Matt just said that from the Montreal experience, they seem to be working. But the fact is that from a scientific perspective or research perspective or, or a evidence-based perspective, we don't really know which, which types of bylaws work and which types don't work. 
because there's not a lot of research on it. Cities usually don't have the capacity to collect that data and to compare themselves with different cities with different regulations or, or, or sometimes the same regulation. So, so sometimes they have the same regulation, but very different baselines. Um, there's a lot of un, un, unknowns around private tree bylaws that we still don't know. We still cannot tell cities what works and what doesn't work. And the fact is that a lot of cities apply this by law subjectively. Uh, like Sandy was saying, they don't have the capacity to review tree removal permits at all. They just approve um, because sometimes they just don't have somebody who can go through, you know, thousands and thousands of, of, of permits per year. So um, they just approve the, the tree removal permits and they don't really have a sense whether that, what's the point of having a bylaw if it's just gonna be applied subjectively if the bylaw has no teeth. Uh, the fact is that we are losing a lot of trees due to the development. People wanna be living in a bigger houses. They wanna redevelop the house that, that they buy and stuff like that. And we are losing a lot of trees, but we don't know what's the effect of the tree bylaw yet. What we know is that we are losing lots of trees. Just yeah, wanted you. to point that out. Sorry for the the, the negative uh, uh, note there, but but as we are all in, in the research field, I think what we can do is that this really provides us a big opportunity to learn more about what, what these things can do, what they cannot do, and how can we can really give cities uh, better information about what they can do. Yeah, and, more and, research always. Can we use that as a note to close uh, the? Uh, Vancouver presentation and get on with Halifax. I'm seeing us. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Closing on five o'clock here. I thought we might be able to make it. So let's see if we can. Uh, we'll share our screen here. If I can see how to do. All depend on your team, Peter. Yeah, I know. I've been, <laughs> I've been grilling them. And we'll come down here to do this. Yeah, Peter, stop showing them things interesting, and it will be shorter. <laughs> yeah, so what have you got on uh, on the shared screen? Have you got uh, me and the title? Yes, it's all good. Perfect. All right, so uh, Jordan and I are going to do a quick presentation of our perusing around the downtown core of Halifax today. And we just wanted to point out that Peter's really taking uh, deletion to canopy cover seriously as he uh, removed a tree today on our walk. <laughs> Yeah, but it was dead, then I don't think dead trees contribute to canopy. It's true, it's true. Anyway, we thought we should put that in. Uh, so we first want to talk about um, one of the largest issues in downtown Halifax as a deletion to the canopy cover, uh, which is urban development. Um, and as most cities that we're all in right now, uh, we're seeing a lot of new buildings going up. And with that comes uh, different construction changes and uh, removals of trees. So on the left here, uh, we have a building that was constructed on the left part of the photo, and then a tree that was left there. However, uh, after the, the building was built, um, the conditions just weren't the same as wind patterns were changing, sunlight availability, and other compaction issues that um, made this tree end up just uh, failing over a couple of years. Um, so although it may be pragmatic to remove the tree prior to construction, this usually harms the reputation of the asset as a lot of citizens don't want to see um, a well-developed tree or well, an older tree being removed, um, even if there's construction going on that will be changing the conditions. Um, so our superintendent of forestry, Crispin, talked a lot about uh, how this tree is technically protected under um, our tree bylaws. However, in practice, it doesn't actually work because a lot of the roots under the ground are not being protected um, from the private development uh, to the left of the tree. Um, and even if this tree was to be removed, uh, or it's going to be because it's now pretty much dead, uh, a similar tree will not be able to ever grow there because the conditions have just changed uh, dramatically. So a lot of the prior priorities of the city are currently aligning more with the developers um, and a lot of our bylaws that are supposed to pr protect our municipal trees aren't, aren't um, aligning with some of those priorities. Um, and just on the right there is another example of some trees that were left on this, this very skinny part of this large hole that's being built for an underground parking lot. Um, and another issue that we saw today on our walk was that uh, 
with, and sort of development, urban development practices with, with respect to canopy cover is the desire lines and encroachment on the tree lines and how that influenced uh, tree health. So as you can see on the image on the right, a lot of folks were not even using the beautiful new sidewalk that was there, but they were using the tree lawn as a pseudo sidewalk, uh, which were, was creating some issues. And then on the left there, the uh, image shows a tree containing mature trees that will, if this was to be redeveloped and when these trees are, hopefully they won't die in the next couple of years, but obviously they will die uh, eventually. The same stature of tree will never be able to uh, grow there just as the conditions again have changed so dramatically and new sidewalk has been poured and there's been a bike lane installed so the compaction of the sidewalks uh, has increased quite a bit. Um, so we did talk a lot about uh, certain, certain ways that we can move forward in these areas of urban development. So on the left there, there is, that's on one of our main streets downtown called Spring Garden Road. And right now they're doing a complete revamp of this area. So there's only about five trees, I think that were actually removed and eventually we're going to get um, three times that amount of number being put in the street. So there are some, there is being, the council, council is recognizing and developers are recognizing that there is um, sort of a, a public pr preference for these trees to be put in the ground. So you can see on the left there that they have uh, huge soil cells going down um, under the compacted uh, pavement so that we can put in more trees there. Um, and we also talked a lot about uh, compensation that the city gets from, um, from developers removing trees and sort of the different ways that compens compensation can be taken. Um, right now, we mostly talked about uh, just placing how it, important it is to place a monetary value on the trees um, and the importance of placing those trees um, or sort of picking the right places for these trees as well. And yes, they might go in front of the developers, but also uh, Crispin, our superintendent, um, can make the choice to put those uh, in other areas. So the next thing we explored in our day was deletions to, uh, was further deletions to canopy cover through uh, pruning programs. This is um, more of a proactive deletion to canopy cover as um, pruning will eventually uh, show a net increase in canopy, um, or we hope to see that. Uh, the biggest challenge we have here in Halifax that we might not see in other municipalities is uh, power lines overhead. Um, this overhead infrastructure causes these big multi-liter issues uh, so it's very important um, to the city that we source um, good stock that have a good strong single leader um, and don't already have codominant stems. Um, here in our city, resource allocation is really important. We have a lot of standing dead trees that need to be taken care of. So sometimes if we see a tree um, that could be um, removed, we'll take a more proactive approach and try to extend its life um, with pruning it um, as much as we can, um, taking into account safety as long as it's not a, a falling issue. Um, every person seems to have a different um, aversion to risk uh, and it has to be harmonized among um, urban foresters as much as possible. It's, it's hard to tell how a tree, if a tree is going to come down. So it's kind of a contentious issue of, of keeping them up um, first and extending the canopy life as much as possible versus uh, just removing them. Uh, so in Halifax, we have a cyclical pruning program. Uh, it's done on a block basis. So an entire block will be um, pruned. Um, although pruning deletes some portions of the canopy, um, it is very important. And we have shown um, in research that was done last year that the um, cyclical pruning program did uh, reduce the amount of 311 calls that were expected. Overall, the 311 calls uh, in our city is increasing, um, but the uh, cyclical pruning program helps to aid in um, the reduction of that uh, increase, if that makes sense. Um, overall, the uh, cyclical pruning program has uh, helped with uh, risk aversion as well um, from the perspective of citizens. So having all that dead wood uh, removed from the upper canopy um, definitely makes everyone feel safer and can help increase the longevity of the tree. Uh, so we took a look at some different pruning pro practices, um, good pruning versus poor pruning. 
So the image on the left uh, shows a good prune. The uh, wound has sealed over uh, quite well. Um, and this was a good example of, of how it should be practiced. Uh, on the right, we have some codominant stems here with some uh, stubs coming out of them, um, showing that that's not exactly a great pruning practice to have established um, as it was not cut exactly close enough to the branch collar um, in some instances, so it's not able to seal properly. So to summarize our findings, um, there are conflicting interests with development, which makes tree protection policy mechanisms difficult to implement and enforce. It's important to carefully manage extension of canopy life with appropriate risk assessment and thought to reputation of the asset. Uh, in our city, the reputation of the asset is very important. Um, we want the public to perceive trees in as positive a light as possible so we can uh, achieve a bigger budget. And um, cyclical pruning is also um, important for net canopy gain, even though um, there is some deletion from the canopy. Yeah, thanks. Here, here. Thank you. There's that thing of mine here. No, it's on this screen now. Oh, gosh. You know, I'm constantly sort of here. I uh, said so it goes. To yeah, but I can't get there. I have to uh, escape. There. Now I can do it. Stop share. <laughs> uh, great. Thanks a lot uh, for your presentation. Right on time. And does anyone have any questions for the Halifax folks? I might have a quick one. I assume, Peter, you didn't have a permit for removing that tree, did you? <laughs> No, but you know, when the uh, superintendent of urban forestry is watching you and laughing, I think that's permit enough to <laughs> remove the dead tree and participate in what I would call improving the reputation of the asset. <laughs> so Crispin talked about this yesterday. He talked about it again today. He wants the asset. He doesn't want to be a slum manager of his urban forest. He wants his, his, uh, the asset he's responsible for to be in as good a condition as possible. And as soon as people see um, trees, which are municipal assets in bad condition, they call their counselor who calls Crispin and Crispin has to explain, I'm gonna need more budget and blah, blah, blah to get out there and improve the quality of the asset. So it's coming along nicely, but asset reputation is a pretty important element of managing this urban forest. Thanks, Peter. Wait, so uh -huh. is, the, is the asset the tree or Crispin's department? Uh, well, it is not Crispin's department. Um, you know, when you, the municipal managers now make a big deal about asset management and it's not their personnel. It is the stuff that they own that's out there in the ecosystem. So stop okay. signs are assets. Um, no parking signs are assets. Um, curbs are assets. Trees are now being seen very squarely as assets, which by the way, would be the only asset that after establishment improves in value. Mm -hmm. Anyone else think, question for the Halifax? Go ahead, Francoise. I think, I think Christian had started to say something when I chimed in. No, I, I just wanted to say that we had a similar experience uh, when we visited a site, uh, I think it was yesterday or the first day, where there was a few dead trees that were still there. And I remember our, the forester, Daniel, was very ashamed. He said, oh, I, sh I should have removed these trees. They look bad. And um, I mean, I think it's true, people are very sensitive when they see that trees are dead. Although we should learn why they are dead, of course, what went wrong, and maybe before we move them, we could learn something about it. But I think it's a good point that we have to make, um, increase the, uh, what would I say, the reputation of trees and our tree management. Otherwise, it may actually have a negative impact. <clears throat> Yeah, what's, what I think is uh, very interesting is to add the um, soil environment to the asset uh, pool. And so if, if you do nothing to the soil environment, maybe you don't count it. Um, you know, if the tree grows, thank God it grew and the tree is the asset. But if developers and the city are both 
uh, really interested to install uh, Silva cells or whatever else they want to install at a cost of at least $10,000 per tree, that has to be counted as an asset too, because that's capital. That's capital, it's not maintenance. And so uh, the city really needs to have a handle on what's underneath the trees, especially downtown, where we cannot afford this reputation erosion. Oswald, do you want to add anything Yes. Well, there was a nice dovetail with our the last speaker that we saw in Toronto today, whose main um, his main concern was to sort of facilitate the sort of slow and graceful death of trees, and and I wonder if there's some PR to be done to sort of normalize tree geriatry. You know, like this is what trees look like when they when they age, and dead things are okay too. And I, I wonder if there's some work to be done on the public side, but maybe even within arboriculture uh, programs uh, that tend to just want live vigorous things. I don't know. That, I find that to be a very interesting concept, this uh, graceful decline and being the oldest person on this call <laughs> and now in this stage myself, uh, graceful decline and ger geriatric <laughs> attention is uh, very important to me. And so while I, I totally adore small trees, especially the ones that are around me in this yard, um, I adore big ones too. And it's high time for me to adore big ones that may be nearing the end of life and extending that to the degree it seems uh, feasible and reasonable to do uh, is probably uh, should become of more interest, not only to the professionals, but to the public. And I think we in the research community to the degree we get involved in public education, have a responsibility uh, to rise to that challenge. I, th I think we have to get data on it too, Peter, just to jump in in terms of research. And that's why like the study Yosef did with you, Christian, in Montreal and, and Philip, who I've been working and Josh is involved with repeating what you did in Montreal and Toronto. I mean, it's trying to collect data and understand what's the real risk, like to quantify it so that we can, the arguments for the benefits, we'll, we'll collect those because we're interested in them, but it's, it's getting the trade-off and getting real data because the municipalities will always err on the side of risk aversion like they they can't afford not to at some level so you know it's up to us as researchers to try and bring those numbers to the table in the discussion in in whatever way we can yeah that's uh i, I agree wholeheartedly sandy and another thing that struck me that i'm very interested in and maybe uh would like to see some research done on is uh you you may see the aerial portion of the tree decline but that doesn't necessarily mean that the subterranean portion of the tree is declining. And we have lots of examples where we've lost the crown, but that tree's not finished yet. And it will produce a new crown. It'll be a different crown. Um, and you know, we've actually exploited that for centuries and centuries by pollarding trees, uh, which we don't really do in a Canadian context, but it's rampant in the UK and throughout the continent of Europe, uh, where it's been practiced for a very long time. And nowadays, we even see pollarding done in urban settings where we don't need to do it. Uh, the original reason was to have smaller wood to use for uh, domestic purposes, but it had to be out of the reach of the herbivores. Uh, but we still do it in many cities. And it, it, to my no understanding, it looks pretty weird. But um, trees have a longevity underground that, is, that may be much higher than their longevity above ground, at least in what we see today in the aerial portion of the tree. And the, it, it speaks to, I think, maybe, and this is again the theme for this week. I mean, it's been the holy grail of canopy cover because that's what we knew at the time. But what you're speaking about, Peter, is like there's these other values that the root system, this intact, you know, the, the still relatively healthy part is providing these other, as we've just heard, is functional values and this diversity. So, yeah, I mean, right now we're still pretty much locked into green, above ground green. Um, 
and what I think what we I hope heard a little bit today is there's other you know we can expand that version maybe canopy cover isn't the holy grail <laughs> uh does that uh, that sounds like a perfect finish to the day sandy uh -huh. thank you. Okay. figuring out how to round it up and uh tomorrow will be equally exciting at least from the halifax standpoint because we're going to do uh, a walkabout of at least six different or eight different land ownerships by institutions all in the southern half of halifax we have such a um, a diverse array of institutional ownerships. And these are not small properties. Some of them are quite big. We're going from uh, national government ownerships to provincial government ownerships to university ownerships, church ownerships. Um, and so I hope the rest of you are going to have as exciting a morning as, uh, as we are uh, here in Halifax.